Good evening. My name is Yvonne Pettis, and it is my privilege and great pleasure to welcome you here this evening on behalf of our host committee, Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, Democracy in North Carolina, Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg, Omega Iota Omega Chapter, of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, St. Paul Baptist Church, and Temple Bethel. We are delighted to have you participating in our virtual nonpartisan political forum this year. Voting is power. The fact that you are here serves as a reminder to us of just how important our work is. You are welcome. Yes, welcome. You are welcome. The next voice you will hear will be that of Reverend Dr. D'Angelo Dia of St. Paul Baptist Church for our invocation. Good evening. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of peace. God of justice, God of grace, mercy, and righteousness. God, we come to you today saying thank you for another day, a day we know we don't deserve, but you have given to us anyway. And God, during this time, I ask that whatever concerns any of us may have, that you would move those concerns to the side, be it financial concerns, physical concerns, emotional concerns, God, that you would move them to the side and bring healing to those concerns so that we can focus on the task before us. God, we thank you for common sense. We thank you for the vaccine. We thank you for the communities that have gathered to coordinate this event. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. God, we ask that you would wrap your loving arms around the communities that continue to struggle and suffer and that you will bring healing to those spaces. God, we ask that you would continue to nurture us to be the kingdom builders that you have called us to be. And God, at the end of the day, I just ask that you give us each enough strength to just keep on keeping on. God, watch over our government officials, hold them accountable, and keep them mindful. It is in your name we pray, amen. amen. At this time, I will turn it over to Ms. Susan Ellaberry. Ms. Susan, you're currently muted. Okay, let's start over. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. I am Suzanne Ellsbury, president of the League of Women Voters, Charlotte Mecklenburg, and I will be serving as moderator for tonight's virtual nonpartisan political forum. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, thank our sponsors for their support. The forum tonight features candidates and contested races for judges and seats for the North Carolina House. The candidates will give respective one minute opening and closing statements. Each candidate will be asked six questions with one minute for their answers. To share the time fairly between all candidates, we ask that everyone abide by the time limits. There will be 20 second incremental warnings on the screen. The audience's microphones will be muted throughout and questions should be submitted via the chat box. Time permitting, all questions will be asked and answered. However, if we do not get to all the questions, candidates are encouraged to answer their respective questions in the chat box after their segment is finished. Candidates and attendees are encouraged to put contact information in the chat to follow through with questions or comments. We will begin with the two candidates for the Democratic primary race for North Carolina Superior Court Judge District 26, seat one, David H. Strickland and Roy H. Wiggins. Uh, we'll start with David H. Strickland with your opening statement for one minute. Well, thank you everybody. Uh, 
Good evening. My name is David Strickland. I am running for Superior Court Judge. And I want to thank you for all the many uh, hosts uh, of this event. It's great. Anytime us judges and judiciary get to speak to the community is a fantastic thing to educate the community. Um, I have previously served you for eight years as a district court judge from 2013 through 2020. Uh, I believed I served you well. I had uh, different leadership positions in the Mecklenburg County Courthouse. I've been the lead juvenile judge in Mecklenburg County. I've also been the lead involuntary commitment judge in Mecklenburg County, working with both our youth and our mentally ill. Uh, in the last survey conducted by the North Carolina Bar Association, I was ranked the top uh, ranked uh, district court judge with respect to overall performance and with respect to integrity and impartiality. We want fair and impartial judges on the bench. You can find more about my campaign at StricklandForSuperiorCourt.com. StricklandForSuperiorCourt.com. Look forward to talking to you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll go to Roy H. Wiggins for your opening statement. I'm very sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. My name is Roy Wiggins. I am running for Superior Court in Judicial District 2016. I am currently one of your district court judges serving you since 2018, having been appointed by Governor Roy Cooper and reelected in 2018. Um, during my time on the district court bench, I have served in leadership positions, including lead criminal judge, lead involuntary commitment judge, and have served in almost every courtroom, criminal, civil, domestic violence, juvenile, family involving children that are taken from their homes for abuse, neglect, and dependency, as well as our mental health and recovery courts, which are very important to try to help people to avoid convictions because of mental health and substance abuse issues. I believe I've developed a reputation for fairness, for treating people with dignity and, and, having, and ruling with integrity with a sense of justice in everything I do. I want everyone that comes in the courtroom who to be treated fairly, to be treated as a human being should be treated, to treat people with dignity. It is my goal to continue doing that as your Superior Court Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will go to Judge Strickland for the first question. A judge's judicial philosophy is defined as the way he or she understands and interprets the law according to an underlying set of ideas and beliefs which shape their rulings. Please briefly describe your judicial philosophy for us. Thank you for that question again, David Strickland for Superior Court Judge. Uh, my judicial philosophy is that uh, my responsibility is to understand what the law is and follow what is written. So uh, uh, as far as an interpretation is concerned, I'm not supposed to make up the law or do things that uh, I see fit. I'm supposed to um, evaluate Sorry, I hear a little back, back noise. Um, I'm supposed to uh, review the general statutes and uh, follow the law that's written. Uh, in addition to that, as far as judicial philosophy, you need to understand and know what the rules of evidence are. You need to be able to understand those and be competent and understand um, the issues that appear before you and how to um, streamline that into the case that's in front of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Judge Wiggins, please answer the same question. Should I repeat it or? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, like Judge Strickland, I'm, again, I'm Judge Roy Wiggins running for Superior Court. Um, like Judge Strickland, I do believe that as judges, we should follow the law as legislated by our state legislature in Raleigh. I do, however, need to point out that a lot of times those statutes are not are sometimes poorly written and have a lot of gray in them and that's where our court of appeals in north carolina supreme court and u.s supreme court come into play so as a judge we have to keep up with the statutes but also with the appellate opinions that modify or interpret maybe not modify but interpret those statutes um, and talk about how they should be applied um, so it is what my practice what i do now is i keep up with legislation and i follow the relevant court rulings that apply to the cases that i handle and it is my intent to continue to do so and continue to learn um, as I each, each and every day as a judge. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go to the next question. Um, Ms. Um, judge Wiggins, again, another question. What criteria would you employ in imposing sentences that are considered outside the standard or recommended ranges? That's a very good question. As, as many of you probably know, we have a, um, so this uh, um, 
system called structured sentencing in which it's basically a grid system in which you based on your prior record level and your and your offense level where you fall into a box and that box can be community service intermediate punishment active punishment and um you do have discretion with those in those boxes and for things that fall outside the norm i think it's important for judges to um, evaluate the um, impact on if there's any victims in the in the um, case to evaluate the impact on um, people that are, um, are are impacted by crime um, effect on the community but also to temper that judgment with a goal towards helping the individual not return to a life of crime the reality is most people that com- that have been accused or convicted of crimes uh, either end up on probation or in some sort of incarceration they're going to be with us in society. So we need to, for their sake and for our sake, we need to make sure that we have a place that help them to avoid future crime. Thank you. Uh, Judge Strickland, would you please answer the same question? Sure, absolutely. First, I, I would not go outside of the box like Judge Wiggins talked about. You know, I, I have to follow the, the, the law that's written by our North Carolina General Assembly, and I'm not going to stray from that. However, um, I do have, there's some discretion and it's a balancing test. I'm balancing um, what happened to the victim in this case and listening to the victim. Listening is a key characteristic of being a good judge, but I'm also going to listen to uh, the defense attorney and listen to the defendant. You weigh different things such as uh, their criminal record, the severity uh, of the act, and you try to balance all of that and make a good decision that um, protects the victim, but also punishes the defendant, yet gives them an opportunity perhaps to re-engage in the community. And my experience from juvenile court, dealing with these type of cases on a daily basis, gives me that experience to be able to do that while a superior court judge. Thank you. Um, Judge Strickland, North Carolina has a problem with overcrowding in its prisons. What ideas would you recommend to alleviate this problem? A, a big uh, issue um, for the overcrowding is on the front end of the case, and that involves uh, bond or bail conditions. Uh, court needs to evaluate um, bond conditions, which is one, whether or not the individual will show up for court, and then two, the safety of the community. We have a lot of individuals, and remember, when you're criminally charged, you are innocent until proven guilty. And there are a lot of individuals that are um, incarcerated, frankly, for months, if not years, awaiting trial because they simply cannot post their bond. And um, an important thing that can be done is coming up with creative ideas to allow that individual prior to trial to be involved in the community, be able to work, be able to provide for their children, but at the same time, provide, um, you know, from a public safety perspective to know that the community at large is still safe. So that's a big deal, I think, in regards to some of the overcrowding is is dealing some issues on the front end with uh, bond. Thank you. The same question goes to Judge Wickens. Um, I won't address the bond issue because I think um, Judge Strickland addressed that, but also on the front end of um, cases, in district court, where I am now, we have um, our district attorney's office with the approval of the court or the judge can divert people away from an Um, convictions, um, people, first-time offenders, put them in diversion programs um, that can um, help them avoid incarceration. Um, Some of those diversion programs are first-time offenders. Some are for people that have substance abuse or mental health issues. Additionally, um, continuing to look for alternatives to incarceration for people that are not a danger to the community. Um, If the court or the judge or or the, the professionals with consultation with the judge, determine that the person is not a danger to the community. And, and we, we're within that box that we've talked about, and we have that discretion to give them a community or intermediate punishment. Um, and it's fitting as opposed to an incarceration. Incarceration oftentimes is the last resort. We've tried everything else. So hopefully we can divert folks um, and help address this issue. Thank you. Um, judge Wiggins, Please describe your direct experience with dealing with persons who differ from you socially, economically, and politically in a judicial setting. Do you ascribe to the belief that there's a need for increased diversity on the bench? And what are your views on the way the court treats members of different races? Excellent question. Um, 
first of all, as a district court judge since 2018, I have tried and I think I've been successful and I can always do better in treating people um, with dignity and respect, regardless of their economic circumstances, um, the color of their skin or any other identifying characteristic um, that we just should not judge people by things that aren't related to their character, to the, to the facts of the case and to who they are as a person as opposed to um, um, things that don't determine the quality of an individual. Um, as, as far as diversity on the bench, I definitely, I think that our bench should continue to try to grow and reflect society as a whole, um, that um, people of different, um, people of color, people of different nationalities feel more comfortable knowing that they're represented on the bench. Thank you. Um, Judge Strickland, would you please answer the same question? It's a long one. Would you like me to repeat it or? No, I just wish I had more time. That's a tough one to answer, okay. it about, but, but I'll do my best. Uh, on the front end, in regards to more diversity, uh, you know, I'm proud that we have a very diverse bench in Mecklenburg County. Um, certainly statewide, we can, do, we can do better, but in Mecklenburg County, from the district court level to a superior court level, um, we are really, uh, it's really great to see as far as we're as true representation of our community and the balance that we, um, that we have uh, with our bench. Um, so uh, that, that's critical and will continue. As far as, um, now you got me uh, forgetting what the second part of the question was. <laughs> uh, do you think, um, how do you feel the um, court treats members of different races? Right, and, and that's where, um, you know, I go back to my judicial ranking where with respect to integrity and impartiality, um, I was rated the top point judge in Mecklenburg County from a district court perspective. Uh, and then secondary, that's where we have to recognize our biases. We have something called RNJJ, Race Matters for Jurisdiction. Kind of to speak fast to get done there, but that is a program that allows us to recognize our biases, and we need to think about that prior to entering any type of judgment and recognize that. Thank you. Thank you. See, you got a little extra time there. <laughs> uh, I have another question for you. Um, North Carolina spends only 3% of its budget on the state court system, placing us 48th in the nation in terms of judicial funding, leaving key elements of the system unfunded. For example, superior and district court judges are unable to hire clerks for legal research, uh, which makes the defendants have to wait a long time for trial. Mecklenburg judges are paid the same as those in small rural districts, making it difficult for judges to live in places like Charlotte. Poverty-stricken defendants who cannot afford bail have to remain incarcerated at the rate of $10 a day before trial and $40 if they're in jail. Are you advocating for changes relative to these situations? And if so, what do you suggest? Uh, thank you again, David Strickland for Superior Court Judge. First, as far as what I get paid, I'll leave that up to the General Assembly. I won't comment on that. I think anybody that's running for judge has a passion to serve the community. So we're not doing it for the dollars, okay? So uh, you know, I, I'm not worried uh, about that uh, in regards to what we're uh, getting paid. Uh, so that's, uh, that's my thought on that. In regards to funding overall, we need more judges. We need more public defenders. We need more district attorneys. We need to be able to try more cases. Um, so I do wish, and I think we can have a voice with our General Assembly, to ask for more funding for our um, court system. I already talked a little bit. You referenced bond in the question. Um, I've already talked about that a little bit, and that's part of the problem. Individuals who say they are innocent are waiting two years to be tried for their case. Our constitution says you have a right to a speedy trial. So yes, additional funding would certainly um, help justice be obtained. Thank you. Uh, Judge Wiggins, would you please answer the question Mr. Strickland just answered? Yes, ma'am, and thank Judge you very much. Strickland just answered, sorry. That's all right, thank you very much. Um, I think that you hit a hot button issue amongst us judges and without the entire judiciary in North Carolina is that we are one of the most poorly funded um, judicial systems in the country. And we have problems that reflect um, um, real issues that need addressed, particularly in Mecklenburg County. And with the, the way we are growing, we're a small 
we're a moderate sized city, but we've got big city problems here that need to be addressed and we need resources to address those. You asked a question earlier about prison overcrowding and I mentioned ways to avoid um, um, for, for nonviolent offenders that aren't a danger to the community to have alternatives to incarceration. And that involves resources that we need more funding for, for attorneys, for programs, for the opportunities to, to address things on a comprehensive level or a holistic level in dealing with individuals, um, defendants and victims of crime and trying to balance the process. Um, to, to community. Thank you. Uh, Judge Wickens, this is our sixth and final question uh, before your closing statement. Uh, since 2021, all of North Carolina's judges have been chosen through partisan elections. Do you favor the partisan method for judicial elections? Why or why not? Well, let me start by saying that that's a legislative decision and I am a judicial branch um, person. I'm, a, I'm an elected or district court judge at this point. So I do have to follow the rules that the legislature puts forth. However, I am entitled to have an opinion in that judges are the, the judicial branch or the branch that should be not be affected by partisan politics. When someone comes into court, um, it shouldn't matter whether they're a Democratic, Republican, Independent, or any other designation. They are there to address their case, the facts of their case, and the relevant issues in their case. And none of that is related to political party, as well as judges that um, judges should not be judged, at least at the level we're at, is based on partisan politics. It's There's good judges that are Republicans, good judges that are Democrats, and vice versa. And I think that um, this is a Democratic primary, and I've been a Democratic my entire life, but um, I, I believe that judges should be nonpartisan. Thank you. And <laughs> sorry, Judge Strickland, the final answer is yours. You'll hear the same thing that Judge Wiggins said, which is partisanship really should have nothing to do in a district court or superior court courtroom. Um, and Frankly, it's sad that it's uh, become this in regards to the partisanship nature of our judicial branch. Um, you know, when I think of family court and juvenile court, when I'm entering orders that are in the best interest of children, whether I'm a Republican or Democrat really should make no influence on that. And what I've always said at public events and talking to people is if you walk into a courtroom and you can tell that that judge is a, is a Democrat or that judge is a Republican, I think probably the judge needs to look in the mirror to make sure that he's uh, he or she is, you know, doing their job in a nonpartisan proper way. So I concur and echo what Judge Wiggins said in response to that answer. Thank you. Thank you. And Judge Wiggins, you have a minute for your closing statement. Thank you very much. As I mentioned to you earlier, I've enjoyed and been an honor of mine to serve this community as your district court, one of your district court judges. Um, and I was appointed by our governor, Roy Cooper, in 2018. Um, you mentioned partisan politics earlier. Um, I do believe the judges should be nonpartisan, but I am a Democrat. I've been a Democrat my entire life and will probably be a Democrat until I pass away. Um, I believe that I am a very good candidate for Superior Court judge with my experience both on the bench and both for practicing law for over 27 years, as well as being very engaged in our community through serving on boards of various nonprofit organizations. Um, and as, as a sitting judge, it has been part of my job and passion to work with other um, interested, interested and parties and other stakeholders in our system to improve our system on all the things we've talking about from racial justice to um, lowering levels of incarceration to finding alternatives to punishment and also keeping our community safe. Um, please vote for Roy Wiggins. Thank you. Thank you. And we go to Judge Strickland for his closing statement of one minute. Again, thank you, everybody. David Strickland for Superior Court Judge. You can read more about my campaign at StricklandForSuperiorCourt.com. Characteristics that I bring to a Superior Court bench is experience. I've had eight years as a District Court Judge where I proudly serve Mecklenburg County. Uh, I'm fair. I am impartial. That's what the North Carolina Bar Association said in that last survey, that I was a top-ranked judge with respect to impartiality um, and fairness. I'm informed. I know and I understand the law and I can apply it properly uh, to a case by case basis. Other characteristics that I think I hold that's important to be a successful uh, judge is a proper temperament and humility. You have to be humble, I believe, as a judge. And I think all those characteristics is something that I uh, possess 
and that I will bring to the Superior Court bench if allowed to serve. So I ask for your vote. Again, David Strickland for Superior Court Judge. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for participating. It's been great having you here. And best of luck on your races. Thank you. We turn now to the six candidates for the North Carolina District Court Judge primary election. Candidates for the North Carolina District Court Judge in District 26 are Christopher Basil and Shante Burke-Hayer, seat one. Cecilia Asagera and Keith S. Smith for seat 18. And Bilal Elrahal and Samantha C. Mobley for seat 19. We will begin with a repeat question from the first segment for all the candidates. Mr. Basil, a judge's judicial philosophy is defined as the way he or she understands and interprets the law according to an underlying set of ideals and beliefs which shape their rulings. Please briefly describe your judicial philosophy for us. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Ellsbury. I am Christopher Basil. I'm running for district court seat one. Um, the district court is the trial court. It is the court of the people, and it is bound by the laws that are written by our legislature, our state constitution, our federal constitution, and those appellate court cases that interpret those laws for us. Our job is to use those interpretations and use those laws and apply them to the cases in front of us. We find the facts based on the evidence and the testimony and the credibility in front of us, and then apply those laws as fairly and evenly as we can for everyone that appears in front of us. My interpretation of that is bound by that precedent and the law is written. I don't write the law like the Superior Court judge candidate said, I apply it. But my philosophy is to apply it in such a way that it is fair and balanced for everyone, that it serves the people that it was written for and that it interprets the situation in front of it as best it can based on how it was written when it was written and when the situation in front of us is presented. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to offer you uh, one minute for your opening statement. Thank you again, ma'am. Um, my name is Chris Basil. I am running for district court seat one. I have served this county as a magistrate for the past six years and have been an attorney here in North Carolina for 13 years. I bring the experience I have earned putting on the robe every day, serving in the foundation of our court, seeing people from all over our community regardless of their race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or language spoken, they are treated fairly and equally in my courtroom now and will be in the future. As a trial judge, I'll have tools available to see those cases through to the end and make sure justice is served for everyone and deliver on the promises that I have given them when they see me at the beginning of their case. At the end of the case, beyond the verdict, driven by the evidence, I am focused on the outcomes benefiting all the people involved, including our society and our community. Those tools available at the trial level will allow me to better do that. And that is why I'm running for district court judge. As a magistrate, I found the most meaningful thing to do with my, my legal career. I'm looking to serve the community more. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we go to Shante Burke Hare, seat one. And I uh, would like you to answer the first question uh, about um, that we had everybody answer the judicial philosophy. And then if you'd like to just segue right in to your opening statement of a minute. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Shante burke -Hare. I am running for district court judge seat one. And just to touch briefly on the philosophy of a judicial uh, candidate, again, our job is to follow the law that is written uh, and to apply it fairly. And to also, it's coming from someone who has tried hundreds of cases. I understand the law, I understand the rules of evidence, and I understand that my job would be to, again, follow the law as it is written. And so that is my philosophy, to follow the law as written, to also to apply it fairly, to, to apply it um, regardless of the race or the gender of whoever it is that is before me. Um, and to segue right into who I am and why I'm running. Again, uh, while experience is important, character is immeasurable. And so my name again is Shante burke Hare, and I am running for district court judge seat one. I am from a small town of North Carolina called Gates County. 
And that's a place that's often overlooked, underserved, underhood, unheard of. Um, but however, I've called Charlotte my home for 15 years now and have served the community ever since. And the beauty in that is that I've been able to understand the different walks of life that stand before a district court judge. I'm an attorney here in Charlotte. I provide services to all, especially the underserved and unrepresented communities, because I truly understand the struggles of the Black and Brown communities. I've practiced in every single area that a district court judge presides over. So I know district court. I've represented criminal defendants. I've been a GAL, which is a guardian ad litem for abuse, neglected, and independent children. I've represented the parents of those children. I've also, I also practice in the areas of family law, as well as estate planning and probate. And so I do believe all of those make for a great, a good judge, but you all deserve a great judge. And that is someone that, that is something I will bring to the bench. So I'm looking forward to the forum tonight. Thank you. Um, next, we go to Cecilia Oseguera um, and Pete S. Smith. Um, and we'll start with, um, and that's for seat 18. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Ms. Oseguera uh, about your philosophy, uh, your judicial philosophy. And then, it, like I said, if you'll just go straight into your one minute opening statement. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Cecilia Oseguera running for district court seat 18 here in Mecklenburg. With respect to my judicial philosophy, I am committed to impartiality. I set um, my point of view aside, carry out the law in a, fair, in a fair and impartial manner. I'm committed to the judicial profession. I understand the responsibility of this position, the very, very important responsibility of the position. I also recognize judicial authority and judicial limitations. I'm also an efficient manager, time management. I understand that the cases need to be resolved for the litigants in, in, timely, in a timely manner. I'm also sensitive, empathetic, and humble. Treat people with courtesy, respect, and dignity. Treat all litigants fairly uh, without regard to socioeconomic background, race, religion. And lastly, my philosophy is also common sense. Um, common sense comes with experience. I am a. Sorry about that. Okay. I wanted, thank you, ma'am. I am an experienced civil and criminal litigator. I've been practicing for 20 years. I've actually physically been in a court, either state or federal court, for my entire career. I've served the public. I was an assistant federal public defender for 16 years. I was voted by my colleagues in the Mecklenburg County Bar to fill this vacant seat. Uh, position, a uh, seat that was uh, recently left vacated by the Honorable uh, Reggie McKnight. I have represented juveniles, adults, as indicated previously, in civil and criminal matters. Um, I thoroughly evaluate the cases, rule in a timely manner, and I do believe um, I am, if elected, I would be the first Latina judge district court judge in Mecklenburg County. I speak Spanish fluently. I think diversity is definitely necessary to enhance public trust in the judiciary. So that's also very important. So I ask that you uh, consider me. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Keith S. Smith for seat 18. Thank um, you, I'm Keith S. S. Thank you, I am Keith S. Smith, the candidate for seat 18, the seat which was vacated by Honorable Judge Reggie McKnight. Going to the question of judicial philosophy, once again, I believe in the Constitution, as other individuals have indicated, we have to apply the rule of law, apply the facts to the particular case, and you have to make decisions absent bias. Of course, you have to be aware of the statutes and follow the case law. There are always appellate decisions that come up that do have some impact on those particular cases. In addition, as one of the other candidates indicated, you have to be familiar with the rules of evidence. Going to... Uh, a little background, I've been fortunate to serve the people of Mecklenburg County for more than 35 years. Most of that has been around the courtroom, whether it was a probation officer for three years, I actually worked as a pre trainer for uh, three years prior to uh, going to law school. In addition, I served the public as a child protective service investigator for 10 years. The last five years was responding to emergencies and conflict of interest. I'm sorry, I was attempting to merge that into uh, my one minute statement. May I continue? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the last 21 years, I've served as a trial and appellate attorney, both as a prosecutor for four years 
and approximately 17 and a half years representing Mecklenburg County in the area of child protective services, where we're attempting to bring families together and make sure that children have some level of permanence. So I've been doing that for, as I indicated, that period of time, both at the trial and appellate level. I am committed to fairness, ability, compassion, and equity. And more importantly, I think everyone deserves to be treated and respect. As the other candidates have indicated, I believe in diversity. Uh, I definitely understand some of the challenges and struggles of this is from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, as well as members of the brown and the black. Thank you. Please visit ksmith.com. Thank you. Uh, and next we go to Bilal F. El I'm sorry about the pronunciation. Could you help me with the pronunciation? Of course, you had it right. El Rahal. Okay, El Rahal. Uh, for your uh, first question about your judicial philosophy, and it, like I said, if you just segue into your opening statement. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's so crucial to highlight what we've heard already as our judicial obligations, right? Impartiality, fairness, uh, dedication to the law, and making sure that everything is applied equally. Those, I think, are our judicial obligations. What I think my judicial philosophy is, is, is within all that, we're going to have a lot of discretion, right? There's a lot of discretion. You're going to have many, many people perhaps charged with the same thing and have the same background and have the same legal statutory um, designations. But as a district court judge, there's a lot of discretion. And that discretion has to be handled with care as well. Every single decision in district court affects people uh, and changes their lives. And so for that, you have to, I, I believe, my, my philosophy is one of humanity and one of equity. Uh, we we want to be impartial. We want to treat everybody fairly. Uh, but fairly does not always mean equally. We have to bring equity into the system and treat people the correct way. Uh, <laughs> and your opening statement. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Again, my name is Bilal El Rahal. I'm running for district court uh, judge seat 19, the seat currently held by Judge Hewitt as she's stepping down at the end of her term. I was born and raised in Charlotte after my parents immigrated here from Lebanon to escape civil war. Uh, growing up, whether I was at Old Providence uh, Elementary or Randolph um, or Harding uh, University High School, I was seen as an outsider um, by other kids and by other families. Um, and when you're an outsider, you either build walls or you build bridges. And I built a lot of bridges. That helped give me a strong sense of empathy, care, and connectedness with others. Uh, and since then, I've been destined for a career in public service. Right now, I serve you at the Public Defender's Office, representing families, communities, people in need, and trying cases daily, almost, in district court. I also practice as a JAG attorney in the Army Reserves, helping local service members with family law issues, landlord-tenant issues, uh, and, ha and have some prosecutor experience with that. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Samantha C. Mobley for seat 19. Uh, would you tell us a little, about your a little bit about your judicial philosophy and then just go right into your opening statement? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My judici oh, judicial philosophy is that I am committed to administering justice fairly and treating all litigants with dignity and respect. Um, right now I serve as a magistrate and as a judicial official, I've taken an oath to uphold the US Constitution and the North Carolina Constitution, as well as the local laws and ordinances. I honor my oath every day. As a district court judge, I will continue to honor my oath and serve each of the people of Mecklenburg County fairly. When hearing cases, I listen closely to the facts from each party then apply the law to the facts. It is important to keep in mind that there are some cases that are unusual and call for additional consideration. I take time to give that consideration before making a decision that's going to affect each party. I'll go into my opening. I grew, in, uh, I grew up in a home that did foster care for children. And growing up, I had 17 different foster brothers and sisters over the years. Children came to live in our home because they had been abandoned or neglected. They had been victims of sexual abuse or physical abuse or parents who struggled with drug addiction. At an early age, I learned that it's sometimes necessary for the court to step in 
and decide what is best for some families. I've had the opportunity to very closely up front witness the pain that children and their natural families endure from being separated from one another. As a district court judge, I will keep that in mind and work hard to bring healthy solutions to challenging problems that families face. My name is Samantha Mobley and I'm running for district court judge, seat 19. Thank you. Um, the next question goes to Ms. Burke Heyer. Judges tell jurors to base their verdict on beyond a reasonable doubt. How would you define beyond a reasonable doubt? Thank you for that question. When I'm in court handling matters, especially criminal contempt matters, and I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone has, uh, for instance, violated a court order. I'm thinking of someone who committed something or violated an order knowing that they should not have violated it, knowing that they had the means and ability to pay their child support or means and ability to exchange the children with the other parent, but they failed to do it simply because they did not want to do it. Not because they could not do it, not because the means was there to complete the task, but simply because I don't wanna do it and I don't wanna obey the rule or the law that's in place or this order that's in place. And so when we're talking about beyond a reasonable doubt, we're really talking about um, more than just, I don't have the money for it or the ability to, to Thank comply. You. Thank you. Uh, please answer the same question, Ms. Ms. Alcigara. Thank you. Beyond a reasonable doubt, um, it, it doesn't mean beyond all doubt. You, you Jurors also have to use their common sense, but, but they also have to look at the evidence very carefully, review the evidence. They also have to understand the judge's instructions when determining uh, what beyond a reasonable doubt means. However, even, a, even the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt, it's not all doubt. Jurors sh should also understand that when in fact there is a doubt, when there's a maybe, could have, would have, should have, then there is in fact a doubt there and they could find uh, the defendant in that case not guilty. So I would I would suggest as an attorney, as a judge to follow jury instructions, the judge evaluate the evidence properly, fairly, impartially, and render a verdict based on a reasonable doubt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith. Hear your answer to the question. Uh, thank you. Great question. Uh, as a former prosecutor, I think you almost have to look at almost 100%. And actually, I would put myself in the uh, shoes of the defendant and hope that the jury is looking at every bit of evidence that is before it in terms of making a decision. I, I think back to the original 12 Angry Men and how that was managed in terms of the process. You have to look at all facets, all of the evidence and anything that leads to some scintilla of doubt, uh, I believe that is uh, in terms of proving to the jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Elrahal, the same. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So the, the first thing that comes to my mind is the rest of the jury instruction. Uh, that judges give juries, which is that a reasonable doubt uh, or beyond a reasonable doubt means that you are fully satisfied and entirely convinced, right? That's the language that's used when judges talk to juries. And that's the language that I use now as a public defender when I'm talking to jury, to judges and juries, because district court judges have the unique, uh, very, very unique place of being both judge and jury. And so fully satisfied and entirely convinced, as we heard, it's not without all doubt, but beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest burden in our legal system, and it needs to be treated with that kind of respect. We have uh, clear and convincing evidence. We have beyond a preponderance of the evidence, but beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest burden. And so it is the most exacting and demanding level of scrutiny uh, that we are expected and that should be uh, crossed in order for a criminal conviction to occur against a person. Thank you. Ms. Mobley, please give us your definition. Thank you. Um, 
for me, reasonable doubt is um, the highest standard as has already been mentioned, where it isn't complete, but um, just reasonably, it is most likely that these are the events that occurred. Um, we take time to really make sure before sentencing someone, because people who are facing that are facing um, the higher, the higher um, level charges in our court system. And it's important that no one go any further unless there is actually reasonable doubt that we're sure, um, or as, as sure as we can be, as reasonably sure as we can be, that this person is responsible for this crime because we don't want anyone in jail who should not be there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Basil, your answer to the question. Yes, ma'am, and thank you for the question. Uh, beyond a reasonable doubt is the standard in criminal cases. And in district court, those criminal cases are misdemeanor cases. And the trier effect, more likely than not, if not absolutely, is going to be the district court judge. So the meaning of beyond a reasonable doubt in my mind is very important because I'll be the person deciding those questions. Um, reasonable doubt isn't absolute. It's not 100%. Um, it is something less than that. It is not necessarily numerical or quantifiable. But it is, like Mr. Ellerhall said, satisfying yourself and convincing yourself. And to do that, you have to examine the evidence and be able to weigh that fairly and impartially. And you have to be able to understand the evidence. So to me, beyond a reasonable doubt doesn't answer every possible question, but it answers the reasonable ones. What is a reasonable person expected to believe? Not every outlandish explanation for possibility, what's within the realm of reason with the evidence you can understand. And the reason that standard is so high, and like others have said, is because we never want to convict an innocent person. That is the goal of our criminal justice system is not to convict an innocent person, to let that person go free. We'd rather err on the side of being wrong than in prison an innocent person. Thank you. Um, Ms. Osagara, the yes. next question goes to you. In your opinion, what are some attributes needed for a good judge? A good listener. Definitely a good listener, um, being able to listen to both sides and decide neutrally. And also another good judge is, is a smart judge, someone who understands the law, someone who understands the statutes, the regulations, and, and knows how to apply the, the law to the facts that are in front of them. So a, a smart judge, a humble judge, a good listener, and someone who's fair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, would you answer the same question? As uh, someone who has good temperate, temperament, um, even killed, is a lifelong learner, someone who is willing to read additional statutes, read additional case law, understand that maybe he or she doesn't know everything, but is willing to take the time, as um, my colleague indicated, to listen to all the facts and be fair in the determination, uh, just making reasoned decisions based upon the facts that are in looking at. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Elrahal? Thank you for the question. Um, some attributes that first come to mind for me are uh, thoughtfulness, patience, humility, um, willingness to, to be understanding, um, to try and have connectedness with the attorneys in front of them, with the parties in front of them, to try to have understanding and to recognize when they're not gonna be able to have that understanding as well, because it's not gonna be every single circumstance uh, where a judge is gonna be able to say, I know exactly what you feel, or I know exactly what's going on. Um, but trying, giving your best effort and recognizing uh, when you're not able to do that. Thank you. Ms. Mobley, again, the same question for you. One of the qualities of a great judge is a good listener. Um, so much is based upon the facts. So it's important that we understand what each party that is involved is saying. Um, my colleague, Mr. Smith mentioned humility. Um, when I interned for uh, Judge Edie Williams, one of the things that I admired most about her is when we would have a criminal case, each and every time, no matter how well she knew it, she got out the law and looked at it and each line one by one just to really, really make sure. Um, so someone who's willing to check and double check, really listen to what is saying. To me, those are two very, 
very strong qualities um, and continuing education, which was also mentioned. Um, as a magistrate, we have continuing education hours, um, specially provided for judges and magistrates where we're constantly learning challenges, or excuse me, changes in the law. And this just helps to build us and make us stronger. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Basil, your answer, please. Yes, ma'am. Um, a good judge is someone who's competent in the law, is able to understand the facts and the arguments before them, but also has patience to be able to not rush to judgment, to hear from all sides before deciding the case. You have to be able to communicate with the parties and with the attorneys in front of you, both your decision and the reason for your decision. People in court are there for the, usually in the worst moments of their lives. That's the experience I've had as a magistrate. People aren't there on happy days. They're emotionally charged and you have to be impartial and keep yourself even keeled and have a good temperament so that you don't get caught up in their emotions, but also can explain to them through those emotions what is going on, what your ruling is, and why your ruling is. People need to understand the court system. A lot of people don't understand the court system and feel overwhelmed. And our role as a judge isn't just to find the verdict, but to help people understand it. So competency, emotional capacity, and be able to recognize your own flaws. You don't always get the right answers, but you have to always strive to be better and always get the right answers. And those right answers may not be inside yourself. You have to look at your own flaws, your own biases, learn about those and set those aside so that you can treat the people in front of you fairly and impartially and with respect, regardless of when your life story is different than their life story. Thank you for all your answers. Um, Ms. Burkow, yours is the last answer to this question. Sure, and it's Burke Hare, Burke Hare, oh, but right. an attribute, it's okay. <laughs> and the attribute for a good judge is everything that every individual have already stated, to be fair, to be impartial, to be smart and knowledgeable, um, all of those awesome um, attributes, but I challenge you to define what a great judge is. And a great judge is someone who has the proper temperament to handle the cases that come before them. Someone who knows how to be empathetic and sympathetic at the same time, but can navigate between the two, because let's be honest, they can look the same. But we also have to serve our people that come into the courthouse with respect. That's a great judge. That is what's important for me to make sure that we serve our community with respect because let's be honest, again, they are coming into the courthouse with the most intimate parts of them, which is their lives. So we have to listen, we have to be respectful, we have to treat them with dignity and be humble at the same time. Thank you. Our fourth question is addressed first to Mr. Smith. Hate crimes have unfortunately played an increasing role in our judicial system of late. What are some issues in the attempt to balance citizens' right to free speech against the need to control crimes of this nature? I'm not really sure how often uh, district court judges will encounter those particular crimes. Uh, I think those primarily end up on a severe court radar. And I think a lot of that really deals with the legislative intent. But from an opinion perspective, uh, having grown up in China Grove, North Carolina, which does not have the best history uh, related to race relations to, over the course of time, I believe that any judge has to look at whomever comes into court from an unbiased lens, even if that person has been accused of some horrendous crime. And you apply the facts once again, look at the law and make a determinate determination based the rule of law without those biases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same question to Mr. Elrahal. That is a uh, great question. Thank you. And a difficult one. Um, I will say, I do think district court judges will encounter hate crimes. Um, I mean, I don't mean necessarily against them, but it will make its way into district court. Uh, because a hate crime is motivated is based on its motivation, not necessarily its severity. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, I've had to work with people who have been the victims of hate crimes and the people who have been accused of hate crimes. And it is it is a significant challenge because, like you said, you have to balance uh, the person's free, free speech rights, the, the fact that whether or not you agree or disagree with somebody personally, you're going to treat them fairly as a judge. You're going to look at them impartially um, and recognizing that there are times that judges have to recuse themselves. Uh, you know, we've, I've had experiences growing up uh, here in North Carolina, in Charlotte, uh, that 
potentially make me not a good judge for every single case. Uh, and if I see a, a case like that come before me and I think to myself, I, I, this hits me differently, right? I feel this differently. Being able to uh, recognize that and say, this is best for the, the courtroom next door, right? Or, or let me sub out and have another judge sit in. So I think that's kind of our backstop is being able to recognize that and not taking offense uh, if we're blind to that. And an attorney says, judge, um, this, this may just not be the best case for you because uh, some judges, it, it can be a very difficult thing to bring up. And I think it's important to be receptive to that. Thank you. Uh, same question goes to Ms. Mobley for her answer. Thank you for the question. Um, I am seeing hate crimes come through um, magistrate court and also in my journey in this campaign have been meeting with different groups in the community. And one group that has, um, that especially stands out in my mind is our LGBTQ plus community. Um, they have been not only the victims of verbal hate crime, but also often um, physical attacks. So um, while making decisions on the bench, it is important to keep in mind as it has been stated that people do have a constitutional right to free speech, but there is a point where it goes too far and it becomes an actual threat and um, deserves to be looked at as a hate crime. But um, this is something that is actively happening in our community. And um, so I just want everyone to be aware that um, people are really dealing with this serious issue and it's just important for us to be listening closely and making that decision as to whether or not it's crossed the line. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Basil. Working as a magistrate at the beginning of the criminal system here in the foundation of our court, I've seen cases that bring this issue forward. I have seen ethnic intimidation charges. I've issued them myself. I've seen where communication of a threat crosses from our First Amendment protected rights to where you're endangering another person. We do have to respect the First Amendment. But there, are, there, are, there are boundaries there. There are boundaries that endanger other people's safety, um, their emotional safety, and their physical safety. And we have to respect all of the people that can be victims of hate crimes. Race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, religion, culture. And to do that, we have to be able to understand ourselves and any biases we may have ourselves with not being familiar with those cultures, with those people. We have to sit down with those uncomfortable situations. We have to make ourselves move beyond our own biases and recognize them. That includes our LGBTQ neighbors and friends, our black and brown friends, our friends of other religions that we didn't grow up in. You have to be able to recognize everyone as in their shared humanity to be able to recognize where that intolerance and ignorance crosses over into hate crimes. And you have to be able to hold people accountable when they cross beyond what is protected. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Burke Hare. <laughs> yes. So when you talk about hate crimes, what comes to mind for me is the fact that most of the time hate crimes are motivated by biases because of someone's race or their religion or their gender or whatever it is that they may practice or believe in. Um, but the reality is that hate crimes can cause enhancements in sentencing. And so we have to be cognizant of those biases and how that affects those who come into the courthouse, um, especially understanding implicit bias. And for me, I would strive to consult with other judges not just locally, but across the state to figure out how can we address those issues when they come into the courthouse, because this is always, this is a learning process. So being able to participate, I believe one of the candidates mentioned earlier on about race matters for juvenile justice, participating in that program, again, that teaches us about implicit bias and racism, um, because it exists and we can't deny that it exists. So um, keeping in mind the First Amendment, but also knowing that we have to acknowledge that bias exists and there's something that has to be done about it. Thank you. Uh, and the last candidate to answer this question is Ms. Asagera. Yeah, there, there needs to be an understanding that there's, there's definitely gonna be a balance between the First Amendment and the need to control crime. We don't wanna chill, uh, although not popular, uh, lawful speech, 
Um, it's important. I, I practiced as a uh, federal criminal public defender for a long time. I did not condone the actions of certain clients. However, um, as a judge, when making a ruling, which could be controver controversial, I think it's very important to explain the ruling if it's contrary to, to, to different, that it's different than a shared the shared perception of the community. And I, I think that if, if a judge articulates those facts by applying the law to the facts, um, the judge has made the proper decision. But again, there's a, there's a balancing that has to occur and the judge has to really evaluate um, the, the balance between the, the, the speech and the, the need to control the harm. Thank you for your answer. Uh, next question, to what do you attribute the high rates of minority incarceration we are observing? This question goes to Mr. Elrahal first. Thank you for the question. I think it is a combination of factors. Um, I think that it is rooted in anti-Black racism and bias uh, that have been kind of baked into our court system over time and that we have to work very hard to untangle and to combat. Um, it can be the, the smallest decisions at the very, very beginning of a case when somebody first appears in front of a magistrate and gets a secured bond. Uh, and then, you know, those are immediately reviewed by a district court judge. And, you know, thankfully in Mecklenburg, we have attorneys that are present at those first appearances and can combat some of those biases and, and start bringing out the personhood and the humanity of every single case instead of relying on shortcuts, on biases, uh, on implicit uh, back, background problems that lead to uh, an increased rate of incarceration, over criminalization, over penalization um, of black and brown people. I think that increased resources will help with that because increased resources will help increase the time and the effort that we can spend on every single case. And we can begin to get away from implicit bias, get, begin to get away from that. Uh, we've heard about race matters for juvenile justice um, already. They are doing the hard work, but they're underfunded as well. Um, but the, the county is getting involved. The county is funding uh, programs. The state is doing what, it's can, what it can, but we need judges that have uh, been in the shoes, been in the district court courtroom, fighting to undo those uh, biases and to try and bring us back out of that. It's going to be a long road, um, but certainly we need somebody on the bench who's have a track record of doing that uh, and is committed to continuing the work. Thank you. Um, speaking of which, we have a question in the chat um, from a Joseph Greer, uh, and I'm going to call on you because you were just speaking of biases. Are judges willing to release results of bias tests to the public? I haven't taken a bias test, but I'd be happy to. Um, I don't hide the fact that I have biases. I mean, we all do as, as people, uh, and it's about, uh, I would love to take one actually, because it would help me learn that. And I've taken kind of, you know, um, lower level things. I've, I've been in Race Matters for Juvenile Justice training, right? And, and there have been training and tests like that, but I think that's an excellent course of self-reflection. Uh, and I think being- we have a comment from uh, Judge Kimberly Best, in the, uh, and she says judges' bias tests are not required and are done based on that individual judge's desire to become aware of their biases. Currently, the AOC has halted trainings of implicit bias and other trainings. So that's, that's kind of interesting. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I thought it would add to the knowledge. Uh, so, uh, well, and I like the point that it's voluntary. Yeah, I like yeah. the point that it's voluntary. Yeah. Uh, but you would be willing to release the results, take the test. And, um, 100%. Anybody else have a comment on this uh, chat question? We just started getting comments and questions in the chat. Oh, Mr. Basil. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I'm trying to manipulate the hand and the microphone at the same time. I know. Me too. Um, <laughs> I have taken implicit bias training both with the Race Matters for Juvenile Justice and with the Mecklenburg County system. 
uh, which is a newly implemented system. I've taken those tests myself. I'd have no problem with releasing them as long as they aren't used in such a way to try and chill the people that come into court or that seek the help of the court. I think that the data analysis of your own biases is something we all have to look at to be able to better understand ourselves and better serve the people. And I have participated with and pushed for bias training, both from the Mecklenburg County Bar CLE Committee and also in the North Carolina Magistrates Association, where I'm the president-elect as parts of the training that we're looking at there to make us serve the community better. Understanding yourself makes you better at being able to understand other people. Seeing where you have gaps in your own knowledge and understanding shows you where you need to work on yourself before you can tell people how to work on other, themselves. Um, that's my response to that. All right, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. Uh, family structure is one of five areas identified by our Opportunity Task Force as needing improvement. Yet family court custody battles usually result in gender bias decisions and trauma for our kids. How do you feel about this issue? And what suggestions do you have? Ms. Mobley, I'm gonna direct that question to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, earlier, I shared with you all about my experience growing up in a home that did foster care. And I agree with the writer of that question. Um, it has a huge impact, a lifelong impact, which also um, requires counseling um, and, and you know, other mental health treatments just to help people to be able to move forward in a positive way in their lives. One of the courtrooms that I work in right now is in voluntary commitment court. And so that is dealing with mental health. And so while sitting on the bench, I am doing my best to listen, to see um, what is happening with the person, what are the types of things that they are experiencing, how often they're able to see a professional and kind of where we are right now. And so it is a serious issue in our community. You'll find that a lot of people who are in jail may um, benefit much more from being in mental health and um, we could get to the root of their problem and that may help them with not um, engaging in some of the same types of destructive behaviors that they may be engaging in due to things that happened in their past. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, we're gonna to return to the uh, original question, uh, which was to what do you attribute the high rates of minority incarceration that we're observing? Uh, and I'll direct this to Ms. Burt Hare. Thank you. So when it when you think about the high incarceration rates amongst minorities, I again come to policy. And so this is a societal issue that's been happening for years and will continue to happen if we don't do something to address it. And it is now being confronted, actually. Um, we have the bill policy where someone's released um, unless you can show that they are a danger to the society or a flight risk. Um, we have uh, treatment courts as well uh, because truancy court is now gone, but treatment courts where we focus on those who have mental health issues and drug court issues, uh, drug issues, DWI issues, we have um, policies and programs in place where we can address those issues such as alcoholism or uh, mental illness and other substances. But we just have to be cognizant of the um, issues that the minorities face and address them and continue to address them. And as a judge, we do have a, the opportunity to preside over those courts, but not only presiding over those courts, but just going out into the community to be amongst the minorities so that we know what issues, further issues do they face that we are not addressing. Um, because again, we need to know what's going on and a judge has to, I guess to talk a little further, serve beyond the bench to stay up to date on what our community truly needs. Okay, thank you. And um, lastly, Mr. Smith, would you answer this question? Thank you. I think my colleagues covered some of the issues, especially as it relates to historical bias. There are multiple factors uh, that impact the rate of incarceration for minorities. I have an opportunity to teach at the college level also, I would uh, argue or provide information related to various areas. For example, when I was prosecuting in Rowan County, there was a high incarceration among Caucasians. So oftentimes it's not the people, oftentimes it's the circumstances. And 
having worked in the child protective service arena for a long time, you deal with a lot of people that come from a position of hopelessness and going to Ms. Burke Hare's position, I think we as individuals, whether we were on the bench or serving as attorneys have to be a part of the community versus being a part from the community. Uh, we have to mentor, we have to provide some level of training, we have to provide some level of education and we have to also provide some level of hope. I think one of the most challenging issues that we deal with is people that have hopelessness, which leads to crimes and other activities. So those are some things that impact the current rate of minority incarceration, but uh, minorities don't crime any more than anyone else. It just goes back to policy and how things are implemented and implicated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Osagera, the Queen Thank has a question. Thank you. I'll be brief. I, I think what's impact, impacting minority incarceration, it's it's been like that for a substantial amount of, amount of time, but historically it's biased, and I will use the word racist legislation, and um, that need, the whole system needs to be unraveled. And fortunately, um, it's, be, it's, it, it's, it's a topic. I wouldn't say it's com completely being addressed, but it's a topic now, a hot topic um, recently. So um, how to combat it? I, no one has a, a quick and easy answer, but I, I do think that there, there should be more rehabilitation instead of incarceration, especially in the drug courts with the drugs, how we've criminalized drugs all across um, the board, uh, more rehabilitation, more training. Um, and which again, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to answer such a very sophisticated and convoluted issue, um, but um, there is a change and, and that is how I would address it is, is attempting to mitigate um, what's going on and, and trying to understand that incarceration isn't always the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, we have come to our final question and Ms. Mobley gets the first opportunity to answer. Please complete this sentence. I believe the greatest obstacles to justice are? Racism and money. So um, I think each of my colleagues did a, a great job of addressing um, racism and how that has affected our courts severely, especially for people of color, specifically African-Americans. I can tell you as a magistrate, African-Americans were brought before me more than any other race. Um, and so I did my best to really listen to what are the facts of the case and whether or not there was actual probable cause. Is this person being brought in because they really did commit this crime or could there be something uh, more here? Also, I think it begins beyond the uh, judicial system. Um, members of the community, some people call people um, because black people are so-called suspicious. And then we know that um, once the police come um, other questions are raised and sometimes it goes to other things. Um, to address money, we're not all dealing with the same amount of money. So bond was talked about briefly earlier. Some people are not able to get out of jail. Um, then once they go to trial, they may not be able to afford an attorney. Yes, the state does to try to provide some help there with public defenders, um, but oftentimes they're overwhelmed with the cases that they have. And it, it may be of a benefit for someone to be able to hire um, someone else. So because thank, people don't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go to uh, Mr. Basil. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure if I answered the last question as well. So I'm going to answer both of them at the same time because I think they're related. Um, I've spent the last six years working in the criminal court. And yes, racism is a problem. And that is a problem that prohibits people having access to justice. And like Master Mobley said, the other problem is money. And what this, what we're doing in Mecklenburg County is we're doing the work, the small steps to try and overcome that. With our bail policy that I've helped implement and been on the implementation team where we're removing the money and that is a generational issue and making sure that people can get out of jail because it's more likely to be convicted. And the more convictions they have, the longer their sentence is. And the longer their sentence is, the less they trust our systems. And without fear, they don't want to act with that fear. They don't want to access our justice system. As a district court judge, you can focus on not just the beginning of the case, but the end of the case. 
so that you're not building longer criminal histories, but you're helping build better futures by providing access to diversion, access to probation that helps them, requires education, requires drug treatment, requires mental health treatment to break the cycle of coming back to court over and over again. And family court, you can build in those structures to help people. So no longer are they fearing the court system, but you're making those resources available to the people that can't afford them themselves. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Burke Hare, could you complete the foregoing sentence for us? Or would you like me to repeat it? Yes, please repeat it. Okay. I believe the greatest obstacles to justice are our funding and lack of resources. Um, I believe earlier it was stated that the, the state budget is 3% for judges and we could use an increase in this budget for funding programs and providing resources to those individuals who need it the most, such as those who suffer with mental illness or to help um, individuals who are going to be released from jail or prison. So re-entry programs um, as a family law attorney and representing children as well as parents, programs that will help them have a more stable home or have a, a job, access to employment. So again, just making sure that we have the funds necessary to provide the resources that the community needs. Thank you. Uh, and the same question uh, goes to Ms. Asagera. It's access to the courts for both indigent uh, civil litigants and criminal uh, defendants. Um, and when I say access, it's, it is financial access. Um, the courts in general, in theory, <clears throat> are supposed to be fair and welcome all people, regardless of their financial background, regardless of their race, color, uh, religion. And that's not happening um, in the courts uh, in the United States at all. Um, how we improve that, I, I won't be able to explain that in one minute and I, I, don't, I don't have the answer, but I, I do think that we're moving in the right direction because it's now, there's a, a, a national awareness of this as opposed to in certain communities or certain uh, groups where it's always been discussed, it's been discussed for years, it's finally reached um, the national level and it's a topic and, and I'm great that we're having this discussion. Hopefully we can resolve our attempt to resolve it. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, Mr. Smith, we go to you for uh, the answer. What do you believe the greatest obstacles to justice are? As I indicated earlier, some of the socioeconomic challenges that people deal with as well as some of the racial biases and some of the other socioeconomic biases that exist. And even before you get to the court, if there is some level of training and some other opportunities that present, then you can avoid getting to that point. Um, that is really the goal of our system is to avoid people coming into, um, you know, that's unavoidable. Uh, people have conflicts and controversies, but if you this thing. Thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, you have your hand up. Yours is the final answer for this segment for the candidates for the race for North Carolina Superior Court Judge, District 26. So would you like to weigh in? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. I will uh, certainly agree racial bias, lack of funding, those are our greatest obstacles. But we have to also recognize that we're doing the hard work now. Neither of those are going away, certainly not by January 2023. So what can be done now? What are our answers now to fight those things? It's collaboration. It's working with uh, other organizations and realizing what resources are out there. Uh, indigency and access to justice in civil court. We have safe alliance. They represent victims that aren't otherwise entitled to attorneys. We have the Center for Legal Advocacy that advocate in landlord tenant and legal aid. Uh, certainly in criminal court, we have the Public Defender's Office. Uh, and other uh, private attorneys that take appointed cases. Uh, and unfortunately, we heard when Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson uh, was being confirmed even that public defenders offices get a bad rap sometimes, but we know how to be effective with the resources that we have 
right? Because we have to fight for every single person and connect them with uh, their legal resources and life resources so that after the court case is over, they're able to rebuild, restore, and live their lives away from the court system and never having to interact with us again. So there are things that can be done now other than just wishing for more funding, wishing that nobody was uh, biased anymore. There are things that we can that can be done now and, and we need people on the bench that have been doing those things for the people. Thank you. And now we'll go to our closing statements. Uh, we'll start with Samantha C. Mobley. Oh, I think you're muted. Uh, My name is Samantha Mobley. I am an attorney who serves as a magistrate at the Mecklenburg County Courthouse. I am running for district court judge seat 19. As a magistrate, I've had the opportunity to preside in a wide range of cases, including civil disputes, landlord-tenant court, involuntary commitments related to mental health and substance abuse, um, emergency protective orders, and, and including temporary custody. In criminal court, I conduct initial appearances and render judgments and infractions and misdemeanor cases. Since 2016, I've served at the Board of Elections at Precinct 122 under Chief Judge Patrick Burris. I volunteer in our community um, with Heal Charlotte and Veterans Bridge Home. During this awful pandemic, I've remained on the bench and ready to serve the community by continuing to hold hearings each and every day. If elected for district court judge, I will continue to be a reliable member of this court. I will work hard to be fair by acknowledging and setting aside biases. I will listen thoroughly to each side of the case and exercise empathy and compassion when appropriate. I will honor and apply the law to ensure equal treatment. My name is Samantha Mobley. I'm running for district court judge, seat 19. Thank you. Thank you. And next we go to Bilal Elrahal. Thank you, and thank you so much for hosting us and for all of the host organizations as well. My name is Bilal Elrahal. I'm running for district court judge, seat 19. Uh, you've heard from all of us today about how we can be fair, how we can be impartial, and how much we care for the community and what we've done in the past, right? But what I ask you to do is think, who do we deserve on the district court bench? Who, who are we entitled to have for us on the district court bench? What candidates out there have the track record of connecting people to resources, of fighting for people in need, and for practicing in district court. Uh, it, the fact of the matter is district court is unlike any other court in the system. It's the first level of trial court, uh, and it's the first level of court where the person presiding in court has to be an elected official, and all of those things matter. And you need judges who on their first day as a district court judge is not their first day in district court. And so respectfully, I'm asking for your support. I hope I've been able to earn it tonight, um, I know my name is a little bit different, so I like to sign off with Remember Justice for All with El Rahal. I'll put my information and contact uh, information in the chat as well. And thanks again for having us. Thank you. Uh, Keith S. Smith. Once again, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Keith S. Smith, seeking seat 18. I have served this community for more than 35 years in various capacities. More importantly, I believe in treating people with dignity and respect. That's one thing that my parents taught me from my humble upbringing in Shawnee Grove, North Carolina, it doesn't matter how much education you have, it doesn't matter how far you advance, if you're not able to bring people. What we are doing at this point level is providing an opportunity to have individuals have their concerns and their circumstances dealt with fairly. You have to listen, you have to be humble, you have to be respectful, you have to understand where they're coming from. I am someone that has that experience whether it's working on the streets as an opportunity service investigator, as an adult probation officer, and as a mentor over the course of the last 30 years, since 1992. Forcing to be awarded as the various Mentoring Alliance Mentor of the Year in 2014. I am committed to the community. I know we're all committed to the community. More importantly, we have to be able to provide opportunities for fairness, affordability, passion, and equity, but we have to do it and simplicity. Thank you. E. Smith for District Court Judge 18. Thank you. Um, Ms. Asiya Guerra. Thank you. 
It's, um, I think it's important to elect a judge with experience. And in, in this case, I, I have an opponent that's very experienced as well. Um, so I, I invite uh, all the voters to visit my website, contact me if they have any additional questions with respect to my qualifications. But as Judge Strickland stated earlier, this isn't, we're not in, I, I'm not in this for the money or the big bucks. I've served the public at, for over 20 years. Um, not only is it my passion, but I'm also I'm also good at it. And that's not meaning to, I'm not meaning to sound overconfident, but this is a, a position that I will not take lightly. I'm very skilled, I'm very qualified, and I ask for your support um, in this primary election. Thank you, and thank you for having me um, on this platform. Thank you for coming. Um, our last candidate to uh, give a closing statement is Christopher Basil. Thank you, ma'am. There may be an, another candidate as well, but my name is Christopher Basil and I'm running for district court judge seat one. I've been serving the community both in and out of the courtroom for over a decade as a master for six years, as an attorney for 13 years. I've served with the Mecklenburg County Bar to make sure that the education of our attorneys and that the attorneys as the board of director, the attorneys are serving our people better. I've served with the, Envi the Involuntary Commitment Committee, Domestic Violence District Court and E-Courts Committee. He's on our district court to make sure our courts are serving people better. And I've also had this experience dealing with our community, every people from all parts of our community every day as a magistrate to have that experience to bring to our district court. I have the integrity to make sure everyone is treated fairly and responsibly and respectfully, and the character to make sure that justice is doled out to everyone, regardless of where they live. And that character is recognized both by the attorneys in Mecklenburg County who voted me their two to one preference to fill this vacant seat, and also the Black Political Caucus who endorsed me as their preferred candidate for this seat as well. You can find out more on my Facebook and website, which I'll put in the chat. Thank you all for your time, and thank you, Ms. Ellsbury, for your questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I need to explain that um, I cannot hear the timer. Um, are you all hearing it? I sort of, trying yeah. to use my phone. I'm sorry, Miss okay. Suzanne, it, and it's not loud. So okay. I, I'm sorry. I just get lost here, and I've been a little distracted by that. And I did forget Miss Shante Burke higher. And so yours is the last closing statement. Thank you, Miss Ellsbury. While experience is important, character is immeasurable. Again, my name is Shante Burke Hare, and I am running for district court judge seat one. I am aiming to not be only a good judge, but a great judge. And this is why. I come from an underserved and overlooked community. I know what that feels like. I know what they go through. I've lived in Charlotte for 15 years. I know what that feels like. And I know what the people of a metro city goes through. I live the life of the courtroom. I've been in every single courtroom that a district court judge sits in. So I don't just talk the talk, I walk the walk as well. But to go beyond my experience, I'm doing this because I have the heart to serve the people. And that's all people, regardless of your race, of your gender, of your religion, of your socioeconomic background, of who your attorney may be. I aim to serve you with respect, with dignity, and with humility, with fairness and impartiality. So I invite you to learn more about who I am as a candidate by visiting my website, burkehereforjudge.com, and I will put that in the chat. And I definitely appreciate everyone for listening on tonight. Thank you. And thank you all candidates, you've been really great and um, best of luck to everyone. Our next group would have been Republican candidates in contested races for the North Carolina Senate primary. No candidates, however, responded to our invitation. So we advance now to our final group, four, counted, four candidates in contested races for the North Carolina House Democratic Primary. They are Ann Harlan, District 103, Romano Bowman, District 107, and Tricia Cottom, District 112, and Yolanda Holmes, District 112. 
And the first question will go to Ms. Harlan. For the third time in 30 years, the North Carolina Supreme Court will hear more arguments in the Leandro school funding case, which began in 1994 and maintains that although our state constitution guarantees every child in our state an opportunity to receive a sound basic education, the state has failed to meet that standard. What is your position on Leandro? So I think that's going to have to be a matter uh, uh, to be de dealt with in the legislature. I don't think that you know, spending all this time in the courts but they're just sitting in the courts and never getting resolved has not been helpful. And we have to make a difference for the kids in the title one, two, and three categories so that they're more equitable. We can't just sit around hoping that the funds will trickle to the kids that need it the most. So I believe that has to happen through legislation. We have to just get it resolved, get it over with, move forward. I think we can't afford to be using tax dollars uh, to fund uh, private schools in any way, shape or form. And I think as we establish fairer taxes uh, in North Carolina, that we'll have the kind of funds that public schools need to get this whole issue resolved. It's a very good question. Thank you. Thank, thank um, you. Mr. Bowman, the same question. What is your problem, Leandro? Thank you, and that's a great question. Uh, my position. I think Mr. Bowman is frozen. Um, we'll go on to Ms. Cottom and come back to Mr. Bowman. Um, Ms. Cottom, what is your position on Leandro? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Trisha Cotham running for House District 112. I'm very familiar with the Leandro case from being a teacher and an assistant principal and a former legislator. We must fully fund Leandro, which has become a very political decision in the North Carolina General Assembly. Republicans do not want to fund fully Leandro. Instead, they want to cipher off that money and divide it to private companies to come in and serve our students. That is wrong. That is not going in the right direction. And we have the results throughout our state to see that. And right here in Mecklenburg County, it is atrocious that only 5% of African-American children will be on the reading level for third grade. And that's been going on for years. That is not just because of the pandemic. Um, I have met with Judge Manning many, many times as my servant service to the legislature about legislation. And we would talk about things and he would come to the legislature and talk to other people. And he was fully invested in this case and in this work. And it is extremely important. And we are doing a disservice to the children across North Carolina, especially the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Holmes, would you give us your answer to the same question? Thank you, Suzanne. Um, when I think about the facts and the details of the Leandro uh, case and situation that um, went into the court system in 1994, we're talking 1994. It is disheartening for us to still be around the table speaking of the case where public schools should be giving our children the best education that we possibly can in North Carolina. And so my position on this is that I am very disheartened and I'm looking forward to ensuring that we work together to do what is right for our children. Our state model is clear. It is to be rather than to seem. So why do we have to have to seem as if we are educating our children, as if we are preparing them for, for this 21st century? So I am very, certain that's my current position and it brings a lot of um, uh, hurt and often frustration because it affects those families that are in the lower class, those families that have always been uh, marginalized when we look back over the history of things and it affects those families who will not be able to afford what it is that they need to have 
and public education. And as a result of that, families and parents start taking their children out of the public education school system and start putting them into charter schools or private schools. While the ones who were primarily the, the, the main reason for the Leandro case are still suffering and don't have the adequate resources, teachers, high quality principals, or education or post-secondary pathways to follow into. And so my position is that I am very disheartened and I will continue to work to move and ensure that we implement a strategic plan to address those matters that has been fought for nearly 10, 20 years now. Sorry, your time is up. Thank you. I have a lot of passion. Have a lot of passion. <laughs> um, with, to be rather than to seem, Essie Um uh, Is Mr. Bowman back yet? He, um, we lost him. We got frozen. So, okay. Yes, I I'm back. I was having a oh, connection. Good. good. Okay. Um, can you give us your opinion on Leandro? Yes, ma'am. Sorry about that having connected issues. But my opinion on Leandro is that we should invest more in our public schools and that we should stop giving money, our state should stop giving money to all these uh, private schools and expand on more of public education in our state. Um, it is an issue that we have to address with the state legislator. It's been stalling too long in the courts and it's something that is vital that we address for lower income communities and communities of color. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you. Uh, what do you think excellent and diverse teachers need from the state to thrive and to remain in the classroom? Number one thing I think uh, excellent uh, diverse teachers need in our state to remain in the classroom is higher wages. Teachers are currently being underpaid for the work that they do for our children in public education. I think we need to raise teacher wages to keep uh, them in the classroom and not go out to other schools in other states where they pay more compared to what North Carolina pays our teachers in education. So that's the number one thing we need to invest in. And we also need to invest in providing opportunities, career opportunities uh, for children in our classrooms and uh, also opportunities to receive a higher education once they graduate from school. Okay, Ms. Cotham, same question, please. Um, thank you. As a teacher of the year twice serving CMS, I really understand the importance of having great educators and diverse educators. We have a big need across the state and especially right here in CMS. To make great teachers, we, we need to do a lot more work at the School of Education throughout all of our universities in North Carolina. That's something that's not talked about a lot, but some of our teachers to be are still learning about issues that were 30 years ago and have not caught up with the times. Teachers need to learn a lot more about trauma and mental health, neurodivergent students, and they need to take the implicit bias test. That is something that is very, very important. And of course, we always need to improve teacher pay and teacher support. Teachers right now are at the worst morale I have ever seen. And it is absolutely heartbreaking that so many are quitting and want to quit and they are frustrated. And we need to do a better job of giving our teachers the resources that they need, but also not making so many state laws that impact what they do or say what they cannot do or what they must do. We must trust them as professionals and they should have a seat at the table. They often do not ever have their voice really heard by lawmakers and that is an extreme problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Ms. Holmes? So when I think about teachers, the first thing that I would like to say that they need is a round of applause and a standing ovation. One of the things that I recognize while working in the school system today is that the pandemic exasperated all of the educational inequalities that currently existed. Our teachers became our frontline workers. Now teachers need to be able to know that they are supported and encouraged 
They need to know that we are here and that we are amazed and grateful for the work that they have done over the past two years in shifting the paradigm to ensure that some of our most vulnerable students are still engaged on a platform that was primarily new to them. Teachers do need to have our support for mental um, awareness. We need to establish, I'm sorry, mental support and awareness, yes, in regards to what they've gone through. We need to establish some places of uh, um, a safe refuge or spaces for teachers to be able to become more comfortable and um, are well mentally. We need to increase their pay, of course, and we need to ensure that they are doing the best that they can with all that they have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harlan, your answer will be the last for this question, and then we'll go to the opening statements, which I forgot before. But moderators Sorry. don't make mistakes, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so um, I've, I'm also an educator. I've been teaching at Central Piedmont Community College for the last 17 years. Um, I understand what low wages are. <laughs> uh, um, if we need, want to keep good, experienced teachers, we're, obviously we have to deal with the issue of wages. I think we should bring North Carolina teachers up to the national average at a minimum so that can, we can retain these good, talented people. I also think we need to offer some level of support. One of the things I do to pick up a little extra money is substitute teach. And I was in a classroom that had 35 third graders in it. And that's appalling. We're not even allowed to have that many adults sitting in a community college classroom. The cutoff is 25 and they had 35 kids and it was a nut house because the, the kid, they were just crammed in that room and it was horrible. And I felt really bad for that teacher. So uh, we've got to have some standards. We need more teaching assistance. We need more resources for teachers. We need to be recruiting from minorities. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess everybody heard it that time. Our timer's I did. back. Yeah. 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 I did too. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Ms. Um, Tricia Cotham, would you give your opening statement? Sure. Thank you so much. And good evening. It's wonderful to be with you all today and these amazing organizations who have sponsored this. I am Trisha Cotham, obviously a Democrat running for the new district, which is House District 112 that covers the town of Mint Hill and parts of East Charlotte and the unincorporated areas of Charlotte. I have a passion to be a public servant. I started off as a teacher right here in this district. I became an assistant principal. I coached about every basketball team where I ever worked. And in 2007, I was elected during a caucus election by the Democratic Party to go to the legislature um, and start serving. I was the youngest female to ever be elected to the state house and that is still true to this day if I'm allowed to continue service. I have a very, very strong record working for equality, social justice, affordable housing, um, trying to bring jobs into North Carolina and make sure that those jobs are equitable across the state and that they do include people who are at the lower scale. Unfortunately, that is often not the reality. I um, look forward to this campaign. It's already been great and very enjoyable. And I've met so many wonderful people. I'm a mother to two boys who are, one is eight going on 40, one is 11 who thinks he's just already in the NBA. So we have a lot of chaos going on at my house and um, I multitask a lot, but that's extremely important skill for to be a legislator. Again, Trisha Cotham, that is my socials on every social out, just Trisha Cotham. Glad to be with you all tonight. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We move next to Vermano Bowman for your opening statement. Yes, ma'am. And I would like to thank all the organizations for having me here today and be able to address the issues that affect our community. And I'm running for North Carolina House District 107 which spans from North, North Charlotte to West Charlotte. And I am running against a 13 year incumbent. Uh, many people told me, oh, you're too young to run or you don't have any chance. Uh, 
I think it takes youth and to have the bravery, the stamina and the courage to run for elected office and to fight for what I believe in and what the people of this uh, working class believe in. And uh, I have been uh, serving in an Army National Guard since 2019. I served during uh, times of civil unrest during the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and also including after what happened on uh, January 6th during the Capitol riots. And I have served uh, both of those positions as a military police officer in the National Guard. Um, I am running because I was inspired by Senator Bernie Sanders doing his 2016 run when he encouraged younger people to run for office. And that's one thing I want to do is to be an inspiration for my generation, Generation Z, to show them that nothing is impossible impossible when you put your mind to it and also to stand up for what you believe in. So my name is Ramona Bowman and I'm running for House District 107. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ann Harlan. I think you need Thank to. You. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Dr. Ann Harlan. Um, I'm uh, been teaching at Central Piedmont for the last 17 years. Um, I'm a mother of five. Four of my five children are adopted from the foster care system. I was a foster parent for years, and they were four of the 10 that did not get a chance to go home to their families. Um, and um, uh, I have a very broad platform because I think there's a lot of room for improvement in North Carolina. But my three top issues are that we need to end, permanently end partisan gerrymandering. It, it, our votes need to count. Everybody's vote needs to count. Um, we need to fully fund our public schools so kids have resources they need and the teachers have the uh, support and the incomes that they need uh, to remain in that job. Um, I also believe everyone deserves health care, everyone in North Carolina. And I think that's going to start with Medicaid expansion, but there's going to be a lot more work to do so that we make sure everybody is covered. It's going to require us to have a fair taxation system in North Carolina where people are paying their fair share. It's going to require some creative work. Uh, it's probably going to require some um, things that are uh, haven't been looked at before in terms of funding, improving our funding, but we certainly, there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. The, the regime that's been in for quite a while has had free run to thank stay you, in power. You, Ms. Garland, your time is up, I'm sorry. Thank you. No, that's uh, right. uh, we go uh, last but not least to Dr. Yo. Good evening. I am grateful to be here tonight as a first time candidate, but not a first time servant leader. I will work very hard to ensure I promote the inclusion of our communities by just listening to understand what is most important for our constituents. And so with that, I believe that the North Carolina General Assembly should include the voices and hear the voices of real people with real stories and not the same political rhetoric that we've heard time and time again. As a professional woman, a mother and a pastor, an associate pastor, let me correct that, uh, I would continue to work and bring those real stories to the forefront. I believe that North Carolina should invest in good jobs, great jobs for North Carolinians. That's very important and that we should, as Dr. Harlan mentioned earlier, seek to expand Medicaid for those who cannot afford that. We are one of the wealthiest nations or countries, I should say, and we still have individuals that are struggling to just receive good health care. And that, that is very unacceptable when we think about what it is today that we are facing. And so I am so very honored to be here to continue to serve with my passion that I've been serving in throughout the community at this next level. I am Dr. Yolanda Holmes, and I am seeking to serve you in the North Carolina House District. Thank you. Um, we will go on um, to our regular questioning now, and we're gonna change focus. Uh, a two-part question. North Carolina is one of only 12 states that has not expanded Medicaid under the ACA. Considering that more than 600,000 citizens, many residing in rural areas are without coverage, 
and that Medicaid expansion is favored by most of our citizens and the federal incentive of 1.7 billion offered. In your opinion, why has North Carolina refused to ensure our low income citizens? And secondly, do you favor expansion? The first question goes to Ms. Cobham. Thank you so much. I can give you the real answer here is Republican rhetoric. Um, before we actually started talking really about Medicaid expansion, President then Donald Trump made a statement about Medicaid expansion. It became a political war among various states and that these red governors did not want to stay anywhere near expanding Medicaid. They hated those two words. Um, and that scares people who are down the ballot, who are leaders right here in North Carolina. So that is the real reason. Um, we have seen a bit of a shift and a change in the last year of attitude with so many people wanting this and absolutely needing Medicaid expansion. It's absolutely just cruel that we think we can treat our North Carolina residents this way. Um, Governor Cooper has been extremely passionate about this topic. I would, of course, follow his lead on this. And he um, is some, this is something that he really, really supports. Healthcare should be a right. It should be equitable. It should be just for everyone in North Carolina. It is not right now. And this is our money as the state of North Carolina. This is our money that we paid into the federal government. We should get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Yo, the same question. Would you like me to repeat it? Because it is lengthy. Yes. Or Would you repeat that question? Yes. Okay. Basically, in your opinion, why has North Carolina refused to ensure our low income citizens? And secondly, do you favor expansion? I will definitely ask that question when I get there, Suzanne, and have a great answer for you when I hear from the voices of why we refuse to help assist our low income families, other than the fact that it is all tied to um, individuals remaining very wealthy and not ensuring that we care for those who have been marginalized and keeping that very system of uh, inequality and inequity in place. And so that is one reason um, that I believe and feel that that is such because we should be caring for the least of these. And yes, I do favor um, us expanding Medicaid because it, because it is vitally important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harlan, to you, please. Yeah, so um, if you recall not, uh, not uh, having Medicaid expansion went all the way back to McCrory when it became a hot political issue that red states didn't, uh, governors of red states uh, made rules that uh, didn't allow us to access that Medicaid funding. And it's just carried through because of the legislators that we have right now. Um, why they're doing it? Well, uh, I think there's a type of hostility that exists in our culture uh, that, um, with the thought that people who are low income are lazy and they're they're not trying hard when they're doing the majority of the work in this um in our country and um when 34 33 of the top 34 countries in the world have national health care there's no reason why the united states doesn't have it but we've got to start where we're at which is north carolina and even before all of the aca went into effect the model was built on Massachusetts having a healthcare for everyone. And there's no reason North Carolina can't make sure that in our part of this country that we don't that we can have healthcare for everybody. There's no reason for that not to happen. And so, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and finally, Mr. Bowman, same question. Yes, ma'am. I feel as if our state legislator, the reason why they haven't been able to provide health care to hundreds of thousands of North Carolinians is because we have too many corrupt career politicians, such as uh, Democrats or Republicans, who serve at the best interest of the pharmaceutical industry and who favors their best interest than the people who elected them. I favor, I don't, well, I do favor uh, expanding Medicaid, Medicare for all, but I also favor 
a universal healthcare system where we guarantee healthcare as a right and not a privilege. In this country, we are the wealthiest country on this nation who doesn't guarantee healthcare as a right. I believe that we should create a universal healthcare system to provide healthcare access to all people, no matter how much money they have in their pocket or no matter what zip code they live in. I support a single payer healthcare system and that system will root out the corruption of pharmaceutical industries having their hands in the pockets of career politicians and funding their next election cycle or giving them contributions. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Yo. Do you favor North Carolina's ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment and why? She's muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yes, I heard your question. If I favor the um, radical ratification of the Equal Rights um, Amendment, that was the question, Suzanne? If that was correct, I'll repeat it. Uh, do you favor North Carolina's ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment and why? Why do you, if you do? So um, based on, on the way the ratification of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment um, um, falls and is written and how we want to ratify that would be my position on that. And it is to ensure that we have the rights that have that, that is outlined within uh, the Constitution. And so when I think about the, the equal rights, we can think about equality, but it still doesn't help us if there's not equity. So when we think about equality, we can say that we're giving um, someone the same level of support in whatever area it is, but it still does not meet our particular need. And that's where the equity comes in. So when we think about that ratification and my position on that, we have to think about exactly how we're ratifying and what it's doing and how we can be effective in ensuring that it will still help to support and meet the needs of our families and the communities in North Carolinians to ensure that we are supporting them and they are sustaining their families and um, meeting the needs of our, our children as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harlan. Same question. Yes, of course, um, I'm in favor of it, but I think that there may be a need for updating it a little bit because I think that we have a lot of issues uh, that we're, we found out more about that have become very much public information. And I think we need to encompass more of those as we do that. Um, we, we, <laughs> we can't even get our nation to you know our federal legislators to vote for the era you know so um i i just feel like we there may be room to put more issues into that pot and update it um i think we have to address the issue of um the how the police are um responding to protesters uh and um similar issues that I think we just like when someone gets arrested in the only charges resisting arrest, I think we have to start look, looking closer at what's going on, look at the data and update it and then then have a bigger package when we do ratify it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have to comment on that. When you said it's out of date, you know, it was written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So uh, there's just so much room for so much room to change to add to it. it it's, it's been a long struggle. Yes. Long time coming. Yeah. Mr. Bowman, um, you're the male on this question. Yes, ma'am. And I do support uh, equal rights and uh, it should be uh, like revised, but we should also uh, work to ensure that every American are treated fairly and the same, regardless of their uh, race and their gender. Um, under equal rights, I would propose uh, that we should basically look deeper into the issues like how other candidates have said of systemic racism and the uh, qualities behind that and uh, gender inequality. So I think it should be looked more into and something that needs to be talked about a lot more often, which shouldn't have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
There is a question in the chat uh, from an, another one from Mr. Greer. Does any Congress congressional co candidate have a sample budget to show the impact of statewide health care? Uh, is there anybody that does have a have that budget? I, so, I don't I have, have a specific budget, but I have a way to make sure that we do have enough money. And I think it starts with legalizing marijuana. You, if you look at what happened in Colorado, Colorado was deeply in debt till they legalized marijuana. I believe marijuana is a plant that God put on this planet and that nobody should outlaw marijuana any more than they should outlaw dandelions. You know, so I don't, I've never used drugs. I'm not interested in using marijuana or any other drug, but I don't think we should be incarcerating people for smoking marijuana. But if we legalize it and tax it, we're going to have plenty of money to make sure everybody in North Carolina has health care. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to have equal time? Ms. Cottom? Thank you, Suzanne. I just want to go back to the last question because I was not allowed to respond to that. Just oh, to I'm sorry, I skipped that you. It's completely okay. Um, you brought it up. I, I absolutely support the Equal Rights Amendment. Every year as the Female Democratic Caucus, we would put forward legislation for the ERA. And we would have a press conference, we would have rallies, we would really talk about it. We would try to bring in other women and, um, and then the events got really big. Women of all ages, it was amazing. But it's really hard to understand why this has not already been done. And um, I have tried to talk with some Republicans on this issue and they say that it's radical. It is not necessary. And these are just crazy feminists. That is the mentality that we are up against. And that's why it's important to elect women up and down the ballot. And of course, men who support this. Um, but I have sponsored this legislation every single year as did every Mecklenburg legislator. And it's one of those that if I'm able to return to the General Assembly, of course, I would absolutely respond. respond. Thank you. And I apologize again for skipping over you. Um, the following question goes to, does anybody else want to comment on that sample budget thing before we go on? We're, we're, yes, getting, I do. we're a little pushed for time. So if you could do it in 30 seconds. Yes, ma'am. And things regarding how uh, women are mistreated or unrepresented in our community, it just distasteful to me. I've seen how women in my Army National Guard unit would be treated by male, uh, male leaders in my platoon. Uh, as if they were subordinates and as if they are basically. Um... Uh -oh, Mr. Bowman's frozen again. Uh, the last question that uh, goes to Ms. Harlan. Um, our state has pro a projected budget surplus of 2.4 billion and a fund of 4.2 billion and has a higher fuel tax than all but five states. Gas prices have risen 100% since 2021. Would you favor the idea of a tax holiday for North Carolinians by suspending the motor fuels tax? Ms. Harlan? Yes, uh, so I am I would be totally for that. I think that's a good idea. I think especially during vacationing season, that that's a good idea to get the ball rolling, to help our economy. Um, obviously, we have a surplus that could be used for things like schools and healthcare, right? But um, I also think we need to start getting away from fossil fuels. So I'm all for the, you know, having tax breaks on gasoline, but I think we also have to have incentives for people to move away from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ms. Carla? Yes, thank you. I, I would, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I was just trying to find Mr. Bowman because I just skipped over him because oh. he was frozen, but I don't want to. We'll go back. All right. Hopefully he'll be oh, able to. Yes, Hopefully yeah. we'll be able to return. Um, this is something that I would support, but talking about taxation in North Carolina is extremely unequal. 
and inequitable. The working families, people working hourly wages are burdened tremendously. And so the gas tax is a complicated issue because there are state laws, there are federal laws, different roads. So it, it is a bit more complicated than just the tax part of it. What's not complicated is rising taxes on, per, on regressive taxes like the sales tax. That is a, a big Republican issue. They love to do that, but they will put forward taxes to help the wealthy to help uh, family wealth go on and on and on. And so the taxation if you, issues don't often get a lot of coverage, but that is really where we do a lot of harm to people in North Carolina. And right now it is so critical because too many people are suffering. They are, can't afford groceries. We all know prices are going up everywhere. We know gas prices are going up and we need to have fair taxation policies. Thank you. Ms. Holmes, same question. Dr. Yo, you, you need to unmute. I'm here. Okay. So <laughs> we know that we have been in quite um, a, a, a disgusting situation when families who are re working very hard, just like myself and most of you, when we go to the pump, there's a lot of pain in the pump when we go there. And I believe that if we take the time to examine where we are, when we think about this oil crisis that we're in and seeing how we can uh, help to uh, sustain our families and ensure that they are still making it through these difficult times, it would be a great win if we did offer some level of a tax holiday and then use that funding to provide even more support for our schools, allocating for our schools and some other areas where we know there's a great need in. So to answer your question, yes, regardless of how shrewd our oil executives can be in the situation that we find ourselves in now, I think it would be a great benefit for us to implement a tax holiday so that we can continue to um, uh, support our families and our constituents during these very difficult times. Thank you. Mr. Roman, welcome back. And uh, we need to ask you if you would support a tax holiday on motor fuel in North Carolina. Yes, ma'am. And sorry about that. I was told that uh, they're having Wi-Fi connectivity issues with my provider. Sorry about that. I'm doing it from my phone right now. But I would uh, support a tax holiday for uh, fuels in North Carolina. Uh, it would be something that would benefit the people of this country and the state. So it's something I would uh, look into and support on a following basis. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to you, and it's the last question, and, okay. and hopefully you won't get bumped again. Um, yes. In 2019, the National Popular Vote Bill, SB 104, endorsed by 15 states and the District of Columbia, was introduced into the North Carolina Senate passed the Rules Committee, filed, but not voted on. The bill will be reintroduced into the General Assembly in 2023. This direct popular vote method for electing president and vice president while maintaining the Electoral College would replace our current winner take all system in which five out of 46 presidents won the White House without the popular vote. Do you favor the adoption of this bill? Why or why not? I do favor the adoption of this bill because it gives all Americans and people in North Carolina a voice in our electoral process when it is so dire, a shallow a breath. Uh, just you look back into the 2016 uh, elections when Hillary Clinton won a national popular vote uh, compared to Donald Trump, and then he won the uh, election it doesn't give people enough representation. And when states allocate their electoral votes to one candidate, instead of dispersal votes, uh, basically on how people voted throughout different sections of the state. So it's something I would support as a, a candidate and when elected into the General Assembly. And it is something that should be talked about more often in this country when uh, our elections are basically uh, being attacked from the Republicans on election fraud and issues 
based on voter IDs that we have here in North Carolina. So I do support a uh, national popular vote uh, bill that will be passed in General Assembly. Thank you. Same question, Ms. Cobham. Um, thank you so much. Yes, I've sponsored this legislation when I served in the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, after a few years of this bill not really going anywhere, it did become more of an interest group bill. And that's really unfortunate when corporations and interest groups and lobbyists want to get involved with democracy. So we must always be cautious of that. And things were inserted in this bill to try to have a compromise, but we should never compromise our right to vote, election results and democracy in North Carolina. And that's what's happened with this bill. Um, it will come up again. I'm not sure that there will be a will for it again, unless some other really bad things are put in there. And that is very likely. And that's why it's just really never made it through because you can't get the Democrats don't have enough Democrats. We have to elect more Democrats to really do all these great things that we are talking about tonight. But the Republicans want to compromise with popular vote, but then voter ID, no souls to the polls, certain early voting. I mean, there's so many things. I was the co-chair of elections, and this is a, a very big issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rio. You need to unmute. Yes, I, I've unmuted. And um, if you could just share, repeat the, the question for me again in regards to the popular vote, um, and then I'll respond to you directly in regards to my thoughts. I just want to make sure I answer all of what you're asking. Okay. Um, it, the national popular vote bill was endorsed by 15 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, it was introduced into the North Carolina Senate, passed the Rules Committee, filed but not voted on. It will be re reintroduced to the General Assembly in 2023. It's a method of electing president and vice president. It still maintains the Electoral College, um, but it would replace the current winner-take-all system. And, uh, you know, it, it's like uh, more fair. Uh, people with the popular vote will go to the White House. Uh, do you favor the adoption of this bill? Why or why not? So when I think about, uh, Suzanne, just voting and all the various roadblocks and voter suppression and everything that is taking place right now, we should allow the people to be able to choose whom we want to serve as our nation's president and or vice president, because historically we have been um, oppressed and um, uh, marginalized and we see things that are coming right back again in regards to hearing our, our voices and what needs to be done and how it has brought about so much lack of trust in the voting process and this democratic process and the integrity thereof. And so when we think about all of those things and um, having someone going just by the, um, the, the, pop, the national popular vote as the uh, president and the vice president would be one that I would um, want to be able to um, be very careful with and careful of when we think about um, how this would go and how things have changed and turned um, in regards to our popular voting um, in regards to our voting and then having a law or bill that will be established to, to just go solely by the popular vote is, is just one that is um, not that I would fare with quite, quite easily right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Harlan, the last question is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, Tricia brought up some very good points that I wasn't aware of. And I really appreciate that. Um, I, I, it doesn't surprise me in the least to think that special interest groups are diving into it and manipulating it. I'm not a big fan of the Electoral College. Uh, that's been the reason that we've had presidents who didn't get the popular vote. And so I would be a big fan of doing away with the Electoral College and having it be a popular vote among everybody. So keeping the electoral college in the bill would tend to make me not be that interested in and in having it pass um but if there was a way to do that where everybody's vote counted because we know everybody's vote doesn't count in this society and it especially doesn't often count in the south where the republicans are often running the show 
And so uh, if someone can show me how that can happen and still maintain the electoral college, I'd be happy to listen. But I'd be really uh, perfectly fine with doing away with the electoral college part of it and voting for a popular vote. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for all your answers. Uh, we're going for closing statements now. Uh, and um, OK, well, we'll start with um, Ms. Holmes. Dr. Yeo. Hello, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so I am Dr. Yo, and I am thank you, thankful so much, thanking you so much for allowing me the opportunity to be here and to serve. I bring to you a fresh perspective. Um, I am not a politician at heart, and I am very proud that I am one who is coming to ensure that the voices of our families and our uh, community is heard at this level and on this platform. Again, my passion to serve in the areas of equity and education and being able to ensure that we work towards the, um, the uh, increase of a minimum wage for our families and ensuring that our children receive the best public education that they can receive and fair and affordable housing for individuals is my primary platform women, children, and ensuring that there's employment opportunities and fair equity, equity for individuals across the state is my primary platform. I am thankful, I am honored, I am humble, and I am a servant leader who seeks to hear your voice and take your voice to the next level in the North Carolina General Assembly. Again, Yolanda Holmes, North Carolina House District 112. Go for Dr. Yo. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tricia Cotham. Um, thank you. I am Tricia Cotham running for the new house seat district 112 where I have lived and served and started my career in education and I'm raising my two boys right here in Mint Hill. I have tremendous experience, but that experience is not just in politics at all. It's about being a real public servant and a leader and working with children who need the most help and they deserve the very best. Um, that is something that is extremely important to me. I have seen the inequities in education, in our criminal justice system, in economies, and the list could obviously go on and on and on. I would like to continue our fight as Democrats to put forward our platform to support our governor. Um, I am a very fierce fighter. I don't back down from a challenge. I am willing to speak up and to speak out when so many are not. I give a voice to the voiceless. I have a very strong record that anyone can check out. I'm extremely proud of my record and my service. I will be a voice for the people of House District 112 and I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and um, Romano Bowman, closing statement. Yes, ma'am. I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to speak before you today, first of all. And I am running for House District 107 here in North Carolina. I am running against uh, my primary opponent because I don't believe in his values and his uh, task of what he has done for this district. I am running as an underdog in this race as to become elected as the first Generation Z candidate to be elected in North Carolina State Legislature. I am running on the platform of Medicare for All, providing health care to all people and make Medicare and make health care as a right and not a privilege. I am running on the platform of creating a Green New Deal and dealing with reversing climate change and creating green energy jobs that will provide people in our community and the state an opportunity to advance in their career and to pay them a living wage and not a starvation wage. I am running this race to provide for the people of my district. I know I am from the working class of this country. I know what it feels like to go to bed hungry and to feel like left, they're left out in society. I am running to change that and to be a voice for many people in my district who's been left behind in the dust by career politicians who've been taking money from corporate America and fossil fuel industry. My name is Ramona Bowman, and I'm running for North Carolina House District 107. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. And uh, Ann Harlan, uh, wrap it up. <laughs> yes, ma'am. OK, I'm Dr. Ann Harlan. I'm running for uh, North Carolina House 103. 
Um, I have um, 25 years experience as a social worker in a clinical setting and also doing home visits. So I've been with families in some very dark times for them. Um, I have you know, not, not only experienced poverty myself as a single mother, but I've also worked with many families living in poverty who are just struggling to survive. Um, I have taught at the community college for the last 17 years. I have good student reviews. I have a high student retention rate because I'm a good teacher. I teach truth. Uh, I don't teach a partisan uh, agenda in the classroom, but I'm teaching the truth when I teach my sociology classes. I have um, four, four of my five children have disabilities. Uh, they come from the foster care system, they have mental health issues, learning disabilities. So I not only work with, have worked with people, but I live it in my everyday life. And I know what a struggle it is as they're becoming adults there are no services for mental health issues. The uh, way the LGBTQ community is treated is appalling when I have children who are struggling with gender issues. So uh, there's, and I think more women and more minorities need to be sitting at that table crafting legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for your answers and your patience. We're so happy you're here tonight with us. Um, Best of luck to you all in the May 17th primary. This concludes our questioning portion. Thank you to our sponsors, volunteers, candidates, and especially our wonderful audience. We remind our candidates to follow through in the chat box. Judge Ty Hands will give the announcements for the evening. Thank you so much. I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. And you are invited to join us again on Thursday, April the 21st from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. for our second primary election forum featuring candidates for U.S. Senate and U.S. House, Rep House of Representatives. And again on Saturday, April the 23rd from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. for our last forum featuring candidates for Mecklenburg County Commission, Mecklenburg District Attorney, and Sheriff, Charlotte City Council, and Charlotte Mayor. Please help us improve on tonight's experience by completing a short survey. We're going to place a link for the survey in the chat. If you pre-registered for this evening, you might also receive an email reminder to complete the survey. We greatly appreciate your feedback as we seek to educate and engage our community. I also want to tell you all about a few election deadlines. You see it on the slide there. The voter registration deadline you see is Friday, April the 22nd. And I'm not going to read through that slide because you all have been very patient with us as in your time this evening. So you can see there, we've got the early voting deadline, the absentee ballot request deadline, absentee ballot postmark deadline, and of course, election day being Tuesday, May the 17th. I do wanna let you know that for the one-stop registration and early voting, that there are 15 sites, and that is again Thursday, April the 28th through Saturday, May 14th. And then as to that deadline to, to our return and request your absentee ballot, it's requesting it no later than Tuesday, May 10th, and it must be returned and postmarked by Tuesday, May 17th. On the next slide, we want to acknowledge our sponsors for this evening. Um, just to state them again, I know we started said at the, at the beginning, but we can never thank our sponsors enough. They are Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Omega Iota Omega Chapter, the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, Democracy North Carolina, Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, the League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg, St. Paul, Paul Baptist Church, and Temple Beth L. Finally, for just a couple of additional announcements, we have a, just a couple from our sponsors. Friendship Missionary Baptist Church will be hosting a seminar titled, What You Should Know About End of Life Planning on Thursday, May 19th, 2022, from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. This event will feature a panel of estate lawyers, insurance companies, funeral homes, and more. To register, please visit endoflifeplanning2022.eventbrite.com. Dot com. The League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg will be hosting the Queen City Family Tree, a presentation on systemic racism in Mecklenburg County government. This will be part of the virtual league talk on Tuesday, May 17th at 6.30 p.m. Registration is available on the league's website 
at golego.org. I'm going to put both uh, websites that I have announced in the chat for you. And now I will pass it to the Reverend Dr. Christopher Harris of Flight Hill Baptist Church in Rock Hill, South Carolina for our closing prayer. Thank you all again for being here. Muted, but can't hear. Dr. Harris, I think you're muted. Muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I was getting a good prayer in too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let us pray. Father, for this information that we have received from these political candidates, we thank you. We also thank you for the discernment that we need to be able to make an informed decision. We thank you for the fact that we've had this forum and we ask that as we go forward, from this place, from this event, from this space that you will continue to guide us in making the best decisions that line up with your kingdom agenda. We ask for your grace. We ask for your blessed benediction. We ask for all of it to be done in the name of your son. Amen, amen. 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 Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night.